intellectual genius Abelard arrogates Eloise's story as he folds it into his own coruscating letter of complaint, the Historia Calamni Tatum, the autobiography of his life. This is the first story of Eloise, and she was provoked to respond in the letters that she and Abelard subsequently exchanged. And that is the knowledge that we have of her from her own person through those letters that she wrote to Abelard and the letters that she later wrote inquiring of him about different aspects of, of religious life. Eloise's recorded writings should also include the love letters that Abelard reports that they wrote to each other when they were first lovers. Now in the lost love letters of Abelard and Eloise, Perceptions of Dialogue in the 12th century France by Constant Muse, just recently published uh, to the great raves of the scholarly world. This lecture concentrates on Peter Abelard, the tutor, lover, husband, and finally fellow monastic, and his report of how he and Eloise met and became lovers. How, as I said, do we know their story? The primary documents recording this famous love affair are a series of letters written in very erudite, formal Latin, which is also capable of conveying great passion. This is the Latinity of the 12th century to which I was referring in an earlier lecture. A very supple Latin, which is just a, an extraordinary pleasure to, to read and, and to read them writing to each other. As R.I. Moore states so succinctly, they found the language in Latin, the analytical technique in the legacy of Rome, I'm sorry, the legacy of Greek, Greece, not directly for the most part, but preserved in the translations and examples of Latin authors, and the materials, examples, and arguments in the Bible, the writings of the fathers of the church, and Eloise especially, the literature of pagan Rome. So when they are writing to each other in Latin, what Moore is arguing is that they are writing from a whole tradition that begins with ancient Greek authors, though those authors are only known to them in Latin, and which continues with a kind of full education in all the great writers up to their present day. First, I think we want to look at their story from Abelard's carefully crafted view in his long autobiographical letter, which is a summary of his life and which was written about 1132. That is, when Eloise would have been about 32 years old. It is entitled the Historia Calamnitatum Suarum, that is, the story of his adversities. He seems to have written it. It's amazing, isn't it, to think about casting your life as telling the story of your own adversities uh, rather than the stories of my pleasures and privileges, the story of my success. This is the story of my troubles. And it probably tells us something about Abelard to start there with the notion that when he wrote a letter about his own life, he talked about it as these are the bad times. He seems to have written it in recollection when he was either serving unhappily as abbot of a very stubbornly corrupt monastery of St. Gildas on the southern coast of Brittany. He was either at that abbey or perhaps he'd already also taken refuge at that point at his family home. Abelard is very conscious of the conventions of classical Latin literature. And so this letter is composed according to very strict rules of composition in the subgenre of the Epistola Consolataria. That is a letter of consolation. This is exactly shaped and structured as a letter of consolation ought to be, although its content is a little unusual. According to these conventions, the writer of such a letter was supposed to tell the person to whom he was writing the letter, the writer tells the correspondent, you think you've got problems, let me tell you about somebody else's problems or about my own problems, and this will make you feel better. Now, it may have been that emotions in the Middle Ages were very different from emotions in the modern world, but it's hard for most of us to imagine that if we say to someone, I hurt my hand and it feels terrible, look at that cut, they're likely to make us feel better when they say, you should know what it felt like when somebody chopped off my arm. This is not exactly what we think of as the first mode of consolation, but it was seen to be and structured as a sufficient mode of composition and consolation in the Middle Ages, in conventions of letter writing. It might seem to us in modern psychological terms to be very insensitive, but we can really not expect someone who had Abelard's, we might say, very self-absorbed temperament to have had 
any such hesitations about telling people about his own life. So Abelard wrote this autobiography, the first autobiography we have found since Augustine's autobiographical confessions seven and a third centuries before. Now, while it was conventional as a letter, it was radical as a statement about one's own self. And he wrote it to an unnamed friend. Dear friend, he said, you think you have troubles, let me tell you mine. Many have suspected that this friend was a myth, not simply because some people think Abelard had no friends, although Abelard, in fact, had many, but because it was, it's so conventional in its structural form that it seems to have been called forth as a way of providing a letter that would be his autobiography rather than a private letter written to a particular person. In any case, no such particular person has ever been named or found, uh, and the expectation is that he wrote it for an, a, an educated public, perhaps even, some think, in a devious way, for Eloise herself. I think something different about this autobiography, and I think that he wrote it as a way of making sure that his own philosophical and theological ideas, which were always contentious and often under attack by authorities, that these ideas would be preserved in a dialogue which seemed to be about something else and not just about that ra the radical quality of his new thinking. Abelard tells us in the first place that he was a member of the lower nobility from a manor called Le Palais, which is located on the expanding frontiers of Brittany, a practically independent province of France, and he traded the role, he says, of the eldest son. We talked in our last lecture about the power of the oldest son. He traded that role, he says, for the contentious life, not of the military, but of the intellectual alpha male. He left, he said, the arms uh, of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of, of the military life in order to go to the lap of Minerva. And yet it might be said that Abelard's training for that life of a knight is something that he kept with him when he was himself practicing as an intellectual. He never put down the weapon of his tongue. The Historia Calamitatum recounts Abelard's brilliant career as a combative philosopher and theologian. He invented the word theology. He invented the word. People were doing theology before Abelard, but they never called it that. He was a combative philosopher and theologian, and this led him to his peak of fame in Paris around 1118 when he taught at the cathedral school in Paris. At that point, he says, his pride led him to experiment, and we know that he experimented with sex and he wrote body songs. Above all, he chose Eloise for his experiment, planning and carefully carrying out her seduction. He got her pregnant. He escaped with her to his family home in Brittany. He married her despite her protestations that she did not want to marry and that he did, she did not want him to marry. And then he returned with her, but not with their son, to Paris. Then Abelard tells the vengeful part of the story. Eloise's uncle Fulbert, who insisted upon the marriage, thought perhaps that Abelard had repudiated Eloise when Eloise was sent by Abelard back to Argenté, at least part of the time, to live. And Fulbert then had Abelard castrated, whereupon Abelard chose himself the life of a monk and insisted that Eloise choose the full formal commitment to a life as a nun. Shortly thereafter, at a church council in Soissons in 1121, which was rigged by rival intellectual, vengeful rival uh, intellectuals, Abelard's book on the Holy Trinity was condemned, and Abelard was forced himself to become a monk at the great royal abbey of Saint-Denis in Paris. Again, this is one of those great 12th century stories. What is happening at Saint-Denis just at the very time that Abelard is living there? The great abbot Suger 
a young man who came out of nowhere and became abbot of this monastery and then took the Church of Saint Denis and made sure that it received all the benefits that you might imagine a cathedral receiving inside the city of Paris. He expanded the Church of Saint Denis. Abbot Suger is the one we literally credit with the invention of the Gothic. You see, if you look at the stones of Saint Denis even today, you can go there and say, and this stone was there before Gothic was invented, and that stone shows us that Gothic has just begun. So we see tremendous transitions in artistic and aesthetic and, and architectural uh, life in, uh, in Saint Denis itself. Abelard should have been thrilled to find refuge in this place that was full of all kinds of good ideas. And he was thrilled to be there, so thrilled that he thought he'd find out what the founder of that monastery was like, what the founder of that whole community was like, uh, and went and looked up the story of St. Denis himself. Now, many of us know that story of St. Denis, the young Denis who was martyred uh, on, the, uh, on, the, on the mountaintop uh, Montmartre in, uh, in Paris, and whose head rolled down the river, to rolled down the hill to the water. And when it hit the water, Afterwards, the body came following, and they floated until they came to the spot called St. Denis, uh, Saint Denis, where, whereupon the arms of the body picked up the head of the martyr and marched off to the space where, uh, where, the, where the body was, the, the entire body was then to be found. And there were other such stories of other kinds of Denises. But the story of the martyr Dennis is the one that Suger and the monks of the community loved most, and that was the story that Abelard, deciding to become a historian, as well as a theologian, as well as a philosopher, decided was pure rubbish. And he told them all that this story was pure rubbish. He told them that this saint whom they honored and to whom they prayed every day was a fake. This did not endear him to the local monks did not endear him to the whole community. In spite of the fact that the brilliant Abelard was a great catch for Suger at Saint Denis, he wasn't enough of a catch to make up for what got caught with him. And Suger and the monks were very happy to have Abelard go elsewhere. He decided to withdraw from Saint Denis, and he founded a new religious community called the Paraclete in a little place called Nogent-sur-Seine, about 50 miles up river from Paris. The politically ambitious Suger of Saint-Denis was always looking for ways to expand the control and power of his foundations and its land. And he managed, after Abelard left Saint-Denis, to take over control of the great old women's monastery in which Eloise was then teaching nuns. And he expelled all the women from Argenteuil. Under the allegation, by the way, that these were women who were living loose lives. And, uh, and we do not know whether the expulsion of these nuns was simply part of Suger's dynastic ambitions for Saint Denis, or whether it was a kind of revenge on Abelard for the way that Abelard had treated the story of Saint Denis or whether they were actually women living loose lives at, at, at Argenté and disturbing the monastic peace as it ought to be kept. In any case, we don't assume that Eloise was ever part of any kind of loose life corruption. And loose life in the monastic world at that time could simply be that women had some of their own families coming to live with them. Those exiled nuns, Eloise, who had become head of the nun school and her disciples, to whom she had probably been teaching Abelard's doctrines, came to the paraclete when invited there by Abelard. Abelard handed it over to Eloise in her sole control, and he moved himself to the monastery of St. Gildas in Brittany, an old monastery where he was asked to be abbot and which was in bad need of reform. His monks there liked him a lot. They liked him so much that they tried several times to poison him. Sometimes when people are paranoid, it's because they have good reason. And we have reason to think that, that Abelard tells the truth when he says that these monks disliked him and tried to poison him. And he says, who could have had more trouble than I've had, he asks his reader. At that point, the Historia ends, the History of My Calamities, autobiography. And then there is this exchange of letters between Abelard and Eloise, what's traditionally called the personal correspondence. 
A letter from Ebel, Ab Eloise to Abelard complains that he should have written the Historia to her directly. She is his wife. She needs his company. He owes her that. She, he ought to return to the Paraclete and live with her. Abelard replies that they are no longer married. She is now the bride of Christ. Abelard's visiting with her in person, he says, would be scandalous. Eloise rebuts Abelard's argument in a third letter. He replies with counter-rebuttals in a fourth letter. In these two letters, there is much discussion of guilt and the danger that women pose to great men. Eloise is even more eloquent on that point than is Abelard. But by the time Eloise writes her third letter, what's called the fifth letter, she accepts Abelard's refusal to come live with her, although he promises to write for her and the nuns a rule, a rule of life, that is, as well as some letters of spiritual and religious and institutional direction, and as well, hymns for a year-round cycle of the liturgy. He made good on that promise. With two more long letters, one of them a rule for the paraclete, which is a very long letter indeed, and 93 hymns. So at least in terms of what she explicitly asked for, or finally asked for, Eloise got what she wanted. This is a remarkable body of correspondence. If authentic, it is the first, first person record of a love affair in human history. And what a love affair. But is it authentic? Much other evidence from the time tells their story. But are these first person accounts authentic? It has been a crucial scholarly question for hundreds of years and it's only become more vexed in our own time. I'll tell you what I think, but I'll try to be fair to the other positions as well. The personal letters were, that is the Historia and the personal letters were, I believe, preserved at the Paraclete, which remained an important monastery for women. As a private treasure, they were preserved for a century and a quarter or so after Eloise's death in the 1160s. Then they were discovered, this is a fact, translated into French and thus publicized by Jean de Moon, a Parisian cleric who wrote a huge book in French called The Romance of the Rose, one of the most important statements of the psychology of love in medieval Western Europe. When I say it's a fact, I, what I mean is it is a fact that Jean de Moon put these into French, whether they started as Latin love, love or others is another question. John, who was something of a misogynist, admired Eloise, loved the tragic story, and emphasized what he saw as its moral. Some scholars, since at least the 17th century French dictionaries, Pierre Bayle, have suggested that Jean de Moon himself wrote at least the personal letters. Most contemporary scholars do not agree with this theory, which would make John even more of an improbable genius in two languages than he is in one. But in the 19th and 20th century, several scholars in several countries found this extraordinary correspondence too extraordinary and incredible to be anything but fiction. Most recently, in the 1970s, John Benton, a distinguished American medieval scholar now dead, was convinced first that the letters were forged in the 13th century. And next, Benton was convinced that the letters attributed to Abelard were actually written by Eloise. I'm sorry, I just said that wrong, that the letters originally attributed to Eloise were actually written by Abelard. A few medievalists from France, Germany, and the U.S. still believe Benton's theory that Abelard wrote it all. Benton based his argument on a minute semantic analysis. A deeper issue for Benton and his followers is explicitly feminist. Isn't the worship of Abelard declared in those letters that were supposed to be written by Eloise? and also the misogynistic view of women in these letters that Eloise supposedly wrote. Isn't that improbable for an educated, reflective woman? Would an educated woman have said such terrible things about women? Are they a kind of male fantasy that could only have been written by a male and probably, as Benton would have argued, by Abelard himself? I will argue Instead, that one reasonable counter-argument is that Eloise may have written them all herself. I don't believe that, but I think that a counter-argument may have been that Eloise wanted to project herself to Abelard as he found her, a perfect male fantasy of the ultimate submissive female. However, the majority opinion among contemporary scholars is that this amazing correspondence is everything it 
says it is, that it's all authentic. I now hold to this premise, at any rate for these lectures, and until countervailing views can gain authorities. Now some scholars, notably Constant Muse of Monash University in Australia, contend that we have not only the authentic later correspondence of Abelard and Eloise, but furthermore that we have the early correspondence of the lovers. Fragments of the love letters that they wrote to each other when they were in Paris as passionate young lovers and when they would be writing on wax tablets, sending them almost like exercises, sending letters back and forth to each other. Are these letters ones written by Abelard and Eloise, or were they later composed, or are they a mishmash of letters written by different people? Muse has made a very persuasive argument in one direction. It's been largely uh, accepted by the scholarly world, though there are some major holdouts to, that, to this position. In any case, it's, this is a whole correspondence that has swept the scholarly world in just the last couple of years. Among the many issues raised in all these letters, one is clear. Eloise was seduced by Abelard. Abelard makes this point abundantly clear in his Historia. The current attempts, as I said, to make Eloise seem older and thus more independently responsible for their love affair are not, I think, very compelling. We may suspect that her pliability, both in age, she was probably around 18, he about 39, and in status, was part of her appeal for him. But neither of them explicitly say that. He does say that inflated by pride at his fame, he set out to sample love. And then he said to himself, what woman would be worthy of me? Many great ladies and simple girls desired him, but he finally chose Fulbert's niece, Eloise. Now remember also that Abelard was not a monk or a priest, though he was a philosopher and a theologian. He was free to marry. What attracted him to Eloise? Her reputation for her brilliant mind and her excellent education, he says. In looks, she, he says, she was not bad. Abelard was not very gallant. But this was an intellectual lust on his part. He probably did not foresee or desire that it would become a famous intellectual passion that disabled his life in some very fundamental ways. But its destiny was clear in its original intention. Abelard reports the affair in a confessional way, taking full blame upon himself. He says first he figured it would be better and easier to seduce her if they lived under the same roof. So he suggested that he rent a room from Fulbert in Fulbert's quite substantial home. For what happened next, let us rely on his own words. He says, in letter four, utterly on fire, I'm sorry, he says in the Historia Calamnitatum, utterly on fire with love for her, I looked for an opportunity to bring her closer to me through intimate and daily association and then to win her more easily. To do this, I arranged with her uncle through some friends of his to take me into his house, which was near my school, at any price he might ask. As an excuse, I claimed that the care of my household was a great hindrance to my studies and too heavy a burden for me. To tell the truth, he was extremely avaricious, Fulbert, and also most eager that his niece should continue to advance in her studies. For both reasons, I easily, his, I easily obtained his consent and got what I wanted, since he was consumed with greed for money and at the same time convinced that his niece would profit from my teaching. Pressing me eagerly about this, beyond what I dared to hope, he fell in with my plan and helped our love along by giving me complete charge of her as a teacher. In this way, as soon as I returned from my classes, I might devote myself both day and night to teaching her. And if I thought her negligent, I might discipline her sternly. I marveled at his simple-mindedness in this affair. Indeed, I could not have been more astounded if he had turned over a tender lamb to a ravenous wolf. By entrusting her to me, not only to teach but to punish, what was he doing but giving me almost complete license to fulfill my desire and provide me with an opportunity, even if I didn't want it, to overcome her by threats and blows 
if I could not do so with caresses. But there were two things above all that kept him from base suspicions. These were his love for his niece and my past reputation for continence. What more shall I say? First we came together in the same house and then in the same spirit. Under the pretext of study, we abandoned ourselves entirely to love and our lessons gave us the privacy our love required. Although our books were open, we spoke more of love than of learning. There were more kisses than conferences. Our hands went often to one another's breasts more than to our texts. If to avoid suspicion, I sometimes struck her. My blows were a mark not of anger, but of the tender affection that is sweeter than any perfume. Need I say more? In our passion, we neglected no stage of love, and if love could invent anything new, we added it. The less we had experienced these raptures, the more ardently we pursued them, and the less our desire was quenched by them. As this delight captured me more completely, I gave less time to philosophy and less attention to my classes. I found it very tiresome to meet them and equally difficult to remain there since I was keeping vigils of love by night and of study by day. I became so careless and lazy in my lectures that I offered my students nothing freshly thought out, but only what I knew from memory. I just recited what I had learned later, and if I felt like composing songs, they dealt with love and not with the secrets of philosophy. As you yourself know in many places, these songs, songs are still popular and they are sung especially by those who are attracted to the same way of life. Eloise fell in love with Abelard. He seduced her coldly, but he too fell in love. He tells us in this very passage that he lost his concentration on everything else once he found himself in the presence and with the experience of Eloise. It is a story of very great passion, the passion between Abelard and Eloise. And they contested this passion for the rest of their lives. Was he ever really in love with her? Those are questions that we find ourselves also asking as you read his story. Was his love for her simply something that seemed appropriate to his station and time of life and out of which he grew? Did he outgrow love? Or was he simply deprived of the capacity of love when he was deprived of organs when he was castrated? Many have read and written over the centuries about their love affair. He himself says, after telling us about how sad his students were at the upheaval of his spirit, that few could be deceived by about anything so obvious, and in truth no one was, I believe, except the person who was most dishonored by it. I mean the girl's uncle. Indeed, when people sometimes hinted about it to him, he couldn't believe it, both because of his immoderate love for his niece, as I have said before, and because of the well-known continence of my previous life. We do not readily suspect evil in those whom we love most. And the taint of shameful suspicion cannot infect a devoted love. As Jerome says in his letter to Sabinian, we are always the last to know about the evils of our own house. Was it such an evil, this love between Abelard and Eloise? As we think about this love affair, we know about the girl who came to meet a philosopher. And when she met him, they met not only heart to heart, they met body to body and mind to mind. The most exciting and unusual part of the love affair of Abelard and Eloise is not that their hearts met and their bodies meshed, but that their minds met. And in the mindfulness was the greatest fruition of their relation. When we think about the love affair of Abelard and Eloise, we learn something crucial about the history of medieval philosophy. When we think about Abelard, however, in relation to Eloise, we must ask ourselves, 
if he really loved, in spite of what he later says. What he says is that she was seduced. Was she, as we ask in our next lecture, merely seduced and abandoned?